Paul Higgins from Empire Music Studios slash Studio 52. Uh, welcome to Australian Musician. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's go back a long way and, and tell me about the origins of uh, the original studio in Collingwood. Well, we, we started Collingwood back in 1986 uh, and I'm still in, in the same business, uh, uh, you know, with, with uh, Trevor Carter, who I started with back then. In fact, we started in, I think, uh, 83 writing songs together, 84, something like that. So we started as songwriters and, and we had a little home studio. Um, and it's funny, actually, the address of that home studio was 1029 North Road. And we're now in number nine Northern Road. Okay. So it's sort of gone full circle, which is a bit, a bit of a funny thing for us. You know, I'm into numbers and, and weird things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we started as songwriters. We had a home studio. I was working for Yamaha Music Australia and TIAC Australia at the time as a, as a rep um, and um, had the opportunity to buy you know, a lot of gear at uh, direct prices as a, as a staff member and stupidly said to Trevor, well, you know, why don't we just give it a go and buy a whole lot of gear and set up a little studio? You know, if we change our mind, we can always sell the gear and uh, not lose anything. But uh, obviously 35 years later, I'm still doing it and still buying gear. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, so it, it just sort of took off. I mean, we, were, we weren't really intending to be a business. We, we were just going to hire it out to pay the rent and, and uh, remain as songwriters. But, um, but it, you know, for anybody who's as old as us uh, would remember at that very time, um, the Prime Minister said that we were becoming a banana republic and uh, that forced the dollar to devalue and all the equipment I had um, ordered that was on it was somewhere between Japan and Australia suddenly changed price and uh, we were suddenly you know tens of thousands of dollars out of pocket and, and really had to become a business in order to uh, you know be able to pay it yeah. pay the bill so we had to, we had, suddenly had to commercialize and put ads in the paper back in the old days uh, in, in the age amusement section, which you do remember. Uh, and, you know, one of the first, the first um, jobs that we got, I got a phone call from somebody wanting to do a children's album um, for, uh, I think it was for EMI. And uh, so, you know, we suddenly had to sort of get ready for this children's album. And we had all these session musicians and uh, people like little Patty being flown in and, uh, all sorts of people flown in. I was, you know, having to, to suddenly become this professional studio and, <laughs> and pretend that I knew what I was doing making this album. Um, but luckily that album was fine and ended up going gold. So, you know, we just said it continued from there. Yeah. Well, what are some of the uh, recordings that you're really proud of over the years? Oh, gee. Um, well, I mean, we're really proud of all the work we've done with Australian blues artists. Um, you know, we, we did a series called Real Australian Blues, and that really picked the blues scene up. You know, at the time, uh, the blues scene was was not really doing great. And, and uh, you know, some of the artists were trying to put little cassettes and things together, um, but nobody really had anything um, major. So, uh, you know, um, we'd done albums for Dutch Tilders at the time. Uh, and, and obviously there were similar artists in each state, but there was a lot of little struggling artists that we, we put on that album, on those series of albums. And, and that then led them to uh, doing a lot of albums of their own. And, and now the, you know, the, the blue sector suddenly got a lot of airplay, including on Triple J. And, uh, you know, we, we sold a lot of those albums. Um, and in fact, you know, that developed our relationship with Shock Records and, and JB Hi-Fi. We sold thousands of those albums and, um, you know, a lot of those names, um, you know, then went on to release a lot of their own product. Yeah. Um, sadly, you had to uh, vacate the, the old premises. I, I believe it was, uh, it's being turned into a, a high rise or something now. Uh, about to be. It's been held up by COVID, of course, like everything else. Um, uh, but the building was shut um, last December and you know, sort of fenced off, and um, they've, I've, I've noticed they've started demolition now. Um, but uh, yeah, so we ha we had to get out. We we knew we had to get out. It, it sort of got uh, extended and extended and extended. Um, you know, and, and in that time, we were looking for other buildings and 
and places to move and trying to figure out what to do. Um, it, you know, it's not like just moving your office or something. It's a, it's a big, big move and reestablishment, um, building new studios. So, and, and um, you know, we could have just gone smaller uh, and, and had a nice little boutique studio to manage our normal, you know, a lot of our clients. Um, but, you know, we've got this project that we sort of see as a bit of our legacy in the business is, is this project called Cool Schools, which um, has been running now for 24 years. And, uh, you know, in order to do that project, we really needed the, the biggest studios because schools tend to turn up with 40 or 50 kids. Uh, and we, we sometimes do a whole album in a day, you know, using four studios simultaneously. So, um, you know, I can't do that in a smaller place. And we, we did look at other studios in Melbourne, but nobody was really set up to do it. Um, so we, we, if we hadn't have gone bigger and better, basically that project would have ceased. And, um, you know, I think that would be a shame because it does a lot of good for a lot of young musicians and emerging artists getting their first recording. Yeah, uh, we'll come back to Cool Schools uh, a little bit later, but uh, tell me about the new facility and the, and the features. Well, uh, when it's completely finished by hopefully early next year, um, we'll have the largest um, studio in Melbourne. Uh, it is, it, there's a, multiple studios in the building, but we'll have a 200 square metre studio similar to that in Sydney with 301. Um, since Sing Sing shut in Richmond, you know, there's really no large format studios available for large ensembles or, or, or just, you know, acts that want a big space. Um, I think that's going to be more and more important in this new COVID world where people need to social distance and you need a lot of space for any sort of larger ensemble. Um, we've also got this, this room that I'm sitting in here, which is Studio 2, which is, you know, 85 square metres. So, you know, technically you could fit 22 people in here with the four, meter, four square metre rule. So it's great. You know, it's a fantastic room for, um, you know, mid-sized bands, you know, jazz is fantastic for jazz. We, we're hoping to do a jazz project in here shortly um, for television. Um, and, you know, great for blues, anything really in that mid-size uh, band space. Um, and um, we've also got uh, a, a one studio that's a little bit smaller, more intimate for we, where we do most, you know, sort of pop, hip hop, um, R&B, that sort of thing. Uh, we also do our mastering in there as well. So um, that's a great room. And then we've also got some production suites, which can be hired by individual producers. Um, so, yeah, so it's really designed to be a, um, a bit like Collingwood, but better and bigger uh, and, and to develop a whole creative hub here with different people working at, on different projects, uh, you know, on any given day. Uh, there's also an art department and photography area. Um, so, you know, we've got photographers coming in and doing photo shoots, um, and uh, which can be quite interesting because one of the photographers that comes in quite regularly is a fashion photographer. So we've, we've often got to people all dressed up and, and doing fashion shoots. Um, so, yeah, a bit of everything. And we've, we've also got nice spaces for doing events, which is something new um, we hope to do. You know, I mean, that, that's something that if you look at studios like, Abbey, you know, like large studios, you know, like this format, you know, like Abbey Road in the UK or, or 301 in Sydney, events are now as a bigger part of the, the new format uh, of, of keeping a studio this size busy as, as recording itself. So, um, yeah, if you look at, at Abbey Road's we um, website, virtually, you know, half of their work is now events and, you know, other, other things. So, um, not just recording. So, you know, we're looking at that model and, and uh, hoping to, you know, to do more, more of those sorts of things as well. You know, little intimate performances, showcases, um, private concerts, that, that sort of thing. Tell me about the, uh, the main desk there and, and some of the equipment that uh, will be in the studio. Yes, uh, Greg, we, we think we invented the whole concept of the Frankenstein desk. Uh, back in 2006, we were, the, I think, the first commercial studio, well, the first one I know worldwide, that um, swapped a large format console for a hybrid of, of different gear. Um, so we have a, 
a digital console uh, here, which is a DM2000, 96 channels of silence, I like to say. Uh, it's just really there as a headphone uh, and monitor mix and for talkback and all those sorts of desk functions. Um, but uh, we don't use any of the inputs or, or any of the channels uh, for anything else. We actually send um, two digital feeds from the, from the RME uh, converters, one to the computer for recording and one to this, the DM2000 for monitoring. So they're separate feeds. Um, and then we have a whole mixture of different uh, preamps in, in, uh, that are right at our fingertips. So we have the computer screen right in the middle, um, rather than off to the side somewhere, you know, so everything's in the center and we've, you know, we're right in the center of the stereo spectrum. So it's, it's fantastic from an engineer's perspective. Uh, and you, you've got all your pre's right at your fingertips. So any adjustment you make, you're not, you know, down at a rack behind here somewhere or over to the side, it's right here, you know, uh, and, and any adjustment you're making to channels, you, you're hearing it in the stereo spectrum. So it works really nicely. It allows us to have, um, you know, a range of different pre's. In this studio, it's mainly valve. We've got lots of universal audio, um, you know, LE610s and 6176s. Uh, we've also got some of the uh, 410, uh, sorry, the seven, the 4710 universal audios. Uh, and we also have a mixture of TLA audio stuff, particularly a lot of the PA1 channels, they're the blue channels. Um, which we really like. That was uh, a pentode valve channel that TLA used to make. Uh, we really love them. Uh, we've also got a couple of warm, the the, um, the WA two seventy three EQ units as well, uh, and we have those linked up with some uh, other outboard gear on the insert channels as well. So uh, I don't know if you can see that over there. Um, this whole console is about four and a half meters wide. So it's, it's pretty big. We've, uh, we've also got a, a Kemper uh, in the rack, um, so which is a fantastic guitar um, sampling sort of box. If, if, if anybody hasn't used it before, they're amazing. Um, you know, a, a lot of the, we use a lot of product that comes out of innovative music because uh, obviously Steve was a good friend of mine and uh, so, you know, there's a lot of stuff we, we got from Innovative, um, you know, so RME, the Kemper, um, uh, we've, we've got a pair of the old MS speakers that he used to sell as well. Uh, and, and the main speakers are Adams and in the wall, we've got EAW 15 inch three ways, which are beautiful with a soft dome tweeter, uh, which are really very rare um, and they sound great. But um, yeah, so it, it's, it's, uh, a hybrid of, of, of sorts. Um, and the beauty is also that these channels are all pure path. So essentially the mic from the studio comes directly to the preamp. Uh, there's no patch bay virtually. We've only got a few things patched. Uh, most things are direct from mic to the preamp and then preamp to the RME converters uh, to the computer. So absolutely pure path, no, no noisy or problematic patch bays in the in the chain so i imagine november 8 uh is the date that uh, you open up a little bit more so it's hard to tell at the moment that, you know nobody seems to quite know that the the current advice is we open when it's covid normal now i don't know what covid normal is technically so maybe you know christmas day perhaps i'm not sure <laughs> but hopefully november 8 i mean i've just come back in today to to get everything ready and, and clean the place up and, and get everything working. We've, we've um, having to replug in all the computers. We took the computers home and we've re rebuilt and modified all the computers and software and updated everything we could. Um, and uh, so we're, you know, just plugging everything back in and getting everything going. Um, so, yeah, so hopefully November 8th. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to Cool Schools. Um, tell me uh, exactly what Cool Schools is and, and when did it begin? Cool Schools began in 1996. Effectively, we did some schools that had come in and booked our studios uh, with their own projects. And we, so we did about three schools that year. And that led us to, uh, to think, wow, this is a really po you know, positive thing to do. Um, I think when the first schools came in, I thought, oh, this, you know, this will be a bit of a bit of fun, a bit of a joke, you know, um, and I, I really 
you know, we were really surprised at how talented the kids were, how good they were musically. Um, and just, you know, in, uh, they were just incredibly enthusiastic and balls of fun, you know. So, so we just had a great time and, and, and it just seemed a really positive thing to do. So we said, well, you know, how do we do this more often and, and build upon this? So, so the following year, we, opened, we started the project. We did 20 albums um, with Victorian schools. And um, we've just built from there. And uh, the, the whole of the project is original music. The kids have to write their own songs. So it's a contemporary music project with, you know, generally small ensembles. So rock bands, you know, it can be jazz bands, it can be any, any genre. So it really, you know, it comes down to what the kids are interested in, what they want to do. Um, and they write the songs and we just provide the studios and, and the expertise in here. Um, just like we, with any other, you know, band that was coming in through and um, with their own material. But, you know, often, of course, these kids are coming into a studio for the first time. So it's really important that we look after them and give them a positive experience, um, you know, and encourage them and, and all those sorts of things. So, uh, yeah, it's it's worked. It's, it's really benefited a lot of kids that are perhaps don't fit into the normal academic situation at school or they're not sports mad you know they're those kids that are creative individuals that don't fit into everything else um you know i was a bit like that as a kid i you know used to sit in the music room every lunchtime and hide away and do stuff I, you know wasn't a mad footballer or um you know uh, all those things so uh, you know i think there's a lot of kids like that that get left behind at school where you know with this project we've found that it really addresses those kids and, and helps those kids so it's it's good from a yeah, on all sorts of levels. It's 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 shown that it's good on a on a well, what's becoming a very important issue: mental health and well-being, health you know, health and well-being of, of young people, um, and you know, as well as it's a great um, pathway for emerging you know artists. Not everybody's going to become a pop star, but you know, the ones that do, you know, it's a fantastic uh, opportunity you know to learn about recording at the age of fifteen or sixteen. Uh, lots of the artists, you know, a lot of artists have come through the project, have gone on to success in all sorts of different parts of the music industry. Um, so obviously the, you know, the well-known names are people like Missy Higgins and Delta Goodrum, um, you know, uh, so, and, but there's all, uh, there's other ones. You know, Andrew, I found out the other day that Andrew Christie, who came through the project, he's now, for, for some years now, he's been working with Hans Zimmer. And he does all the Simpsons music at uh, Bleeding hands music in the in the US so you know you, I just find all these weird wonderful cases of people who've gone on to great you know careers in music um, you know what part we played I don't know but I mean you know it must have had some uh, beneficial impact uh, you know because uh, every musician you know that I talk to so you know so gee I wish I'd had that opportunity when I was 15 you know rather than starting my career when you know starting recording when I was 20 or 25 or something yeah, and it's not just the recording aspect. There's also an awards night where they get to perform. Yes, yes, we we, we, we um, affectionately call it the Arias for young players. Um, it, it's just based on the same Arias format. You know, uh, at the time I'd been to the Arias a few times, and 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 uh, I thought, right, well, we need to sort of copy that, and and you know, so we have all the nominations. It, you know, again, it's 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 not the project is not a competition like an you know like an idol or an x factor or a voice or something like that it's it's really just meant to be a vocational project and and the awards night is to recognize what's been done and and um we get uh usually about 20 acts to perform live on the night and uh as a showcase they just get up and do one song each and uh we have the awards for different categories so it's, it's really designed to try and encourage as many people um and uh you know keep people playing and, and writing mainly you know as i say the main focus is on the getting people to write songs at an early age yeah so what's the plan going forward i, I believe you're seeking uh sponsors that uh, might be able to benefit from involvement yeah look i mean uh, um, is one of the the difficult things with running a project for so long for you know 20 now heading into the 25th year is is mainly maintaining new you know sponsorship all the time. I mean, we've, we started, believe it or not, with Apple computers was our main sponsor. I don't think you get Apple computers now to sponsor anything they don't need to. Um, but, um, you know, 
our, one of our recent sponsors for, for, for 10 years was JB Hi-Fi, which was a fantastic sponsor to be working with. Um, so, you know, we're, we're constantly looking for support to keep the project going um, and to subsidise the, you know, the cost to schools uh, to be involved. Um, you know, we, over the years, we've worked with people like Kodak Australia, Yamaha Music Australia, sponsored the project for a long, long time. Um, uh, you know, a variety of other music companies, um, other software companies. Um, so, we, and we've had a fair bit of government support. We were funded by the Howard government for six or seven years uh, through the Youth Bureau. Um, and, and at that stage, we were running the project in five, we got up to five states. We were running the project with studios in, in five different cities. Uh, that was pretty manic. Um, and um, so, but we've, we've scaled down in recent years, we've been running in Melbourne and, and Sydney. Um, but, you know, we would like to, you know, build it up again if, if, if we could get the support, particularly from the federal government. We're trying to, to gain support at that level at the moment. Um, but yeah, we're looking for both government and corporate sponsorship to, to assist. All right, Paul, it's been uh, great to catch up. Uh, I guess it's uh, a matter of keeping your eye on the news as to uh, when studios can open up fully. Um, so uh, we wish you well in the new premises. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for your time.